All right, welcome to the first installment of Forensic Science 101, taking a look at the overview. So we'll jump in here, and feel free at any point to pause the video, take further note of something, cross-reference something, um, and so we'll start in with some of the objectives. And again, feel free to pause the video um, as I'm going to go a little bit quickly here. Make sure that you're familiar by, with these terms and by the end of the uh, screencast that you uh, understand the meaning and the history behind some of these terms. Again, feel free to pause the video here. So take a look at the historical development of forensic science. Uh, Bertillon was a, a guy who began um, thinking about how to differentiate uh, different individuals. And this was before fingerprinting was uh, really extensively used. He used body measurements. There's a case uh, about guys named William and Will West who were uh, not identical twins but actually may be somewhat related as it turns out but they were confused for one another in, in prison because they had the exact same measurements. So that was a limitation of the Pertillon system. Sir Edward Richard Henry um, was the one to distinguish fingerprints by these three major categories, whorl, loop, and arch, which we still use today. Um, and then the discovery of blood groups, followed by Edmund Locard's, Locard's principle, um, which is still used today and is the basic um, piece behind our use of trace evidence. Uh, the idea that when you visit a scene or come up against somebody, um, that there's something that you have deposited in that place or upon that person and that they've deposited upon you or that that scene has deposited upon you. And so that idea um, that we leave behind something, whether it's hair or, or fingernail or DNA in some form, um, is the basis behind our use of trace evidence to link a perpetrator to or, or a suspect or person to um, a, cr a scene, could be even be a victim, or person-to-person -person linkage. All right, comparison microscope is used especially with ballistics. Um, perhaps you remember from biology, Rosalind Franklin, James Watson, and Francis Crick um, having uh, big roles in the discovery of DNA as the uh, heritable information. And then Alec Jeffries in 1984 invented the current model of DNA fingerprinting, which was first used in criminal case in 1987. So one of the reasons that I love teaching forensics is that there are so many different disciplines that are integrated into the study. So biology, chemistry, physics are very obviously integrated. Uh, but then there are also things outside of the sciences um, in terms of technology, the social studies. Um, so if you're in a government class, you'll see a lot of things that kind of come alongside what we're looking at. Law. Um, and then different mathematics and things like that. There are also a lot of different career paths within forensics. Some of the examples are here, nurse, chemist, toxicologist, uh, forensic accountant even. Uh, so there are some really interesting uh, disciplines stemming from that. Okay, the scientific method is important here um, in terms of doing research that is unbiased, that can be um, replicated, and so following the steps, identifying the problem, research, hypothesis, and then testing to evaluate the, legit the legitimacy of that hypothesis. So, uh, starting out with the Crime Scene Investigation Team, uh, CSI, their goal is um, to work together to process a scene and evaluate the evidence. Uh, pictured here is a lady named Sarah Stowers who uh, works with our Forsyth County CSI team. And here she is in my classroom um, working out some information about uh, bones during our fr forensic anthropology investigation. So she and I were constructing uh, an answer key for a crimes investigation that you all will do later in the year. So the job of the CSI team um, is first uh, to photograph. Now this starts out with securing the scene and that's actually done by law enforcement. So the, the crime scene investigators, contrary to how it's shown on TV, actually do not carry guns. Uh, that's the job of, of the officer um, to secure the scene. 
before the CSIs would come onto the onto the scene. Photographing, searching, collecting, and packaging, and we'll talk about all that um, and the proper techniques for that. Uh, uh, completing the proper forms, including chain of custody, which is really big. And then um, this breaks down into crime lab scientists and uh, reviewing the paperwork, completing the tests. In our county, uh, the crime scene investigative team does this and they do this. So in order to process a scene, there are systematic ways of searching that scene. I remember when I was um, with my husband and some friends at a lake house and we were there for the weekend and one guy lost his keys and everybody spent hours trying to find his keys so he could drive home, you know, a couple hours um, from where we were from and uh, we never found them. Despite my husband's suggestion to do a grid pattern search, which I thought was so systematic and so great, but um, we never found them and I wonder if they actually ended up in the lake. That sort of strategy uh, would be used by a crime scene investigation team to try to find evidence, to try to find a body, and there are basically four major types of ways to search a scene. The zone pattern um, is just like it sounds, uh, breaking up the zones of a scene, oftentimes indoors, um, and letting a different member of the CSI team search that zone. It can be subdivided into smaller zones and then they may even switch and actually redo someone else's zone. Um, there's also a spiral. This is really good for large area areas, um, especially outdoors, especially if you're looking for something larger like a body. You could do an inward spiral, which starts on the outside and goes inward, like you see here, or you can do an outward spiral, where it starts on the inside and goes outward. And usually multiple people would be working on that. Um, a line search, has to be multiple people. And, and like you see here, uh, people line up about arm's length apart and they go in one direction searching for an evidence of a certain type. Um, this would usually be when you're looking for a large object. And then lastly, the grid pattern is just like the line except after doing one direction, you would go back and do a 90 degree angle from your first direction and you would go and search that direction as well. So that would be even more thorough. Okay, there's two basic types of evidence. The first is testimonial evidence, and as its name suggests, that would be um, a person who is giving testimony. So it's also known as direct evidence because it's directly speaking to that person's um, having seen or experienced um, what happened during the crime. The other type of evidence, which is the main type of evidence that our course will focus on, is circumstantial evidence. And circumstantial makes it sound like it's really not that great of a source of evidence. It just happened to be there. But that's actually um, synonymous with physical evidence. And so that would include hair. That would include DNA through blood. Um, that would include the blood spatter on the wall. That would include cartridges uh, from a firearm. So our course will really focus in on that physical evidence that can be evaluated scientifically. Now, speaking of evidence, one of the most important things that an investigator will do is to track the custody or who held on to that evidence, who is responsible for it from the time of collection toward the end of when it was processed. And so this would be an example of documentation of what that chain of custody would look like. Provides a paper trail and without it, your evidence, no matter how good, is inadmissible in court. So in addition to the two types of evidence being testimonial and physical, there are two other distinctions of evidence, class and individual. Now, let me go ahead and ask you, I'm going to pose this question. If you had a choice, would you rather have class evidence or individual evidence? And I want you to think about that answer as I go through and talk about the differences between the two. Um, class evidence is good for reducing the number of suspects to a subclass or group of people. Um, individual evidence would point directly to one suspect. So, for example, hair evidence. Well, if it doesn't have the follicle, then it doesn't have DNA. And therefore, you could narrow down to people that have a certain type of medulla that looks like this. But you couldn't narrow it down to just one person. If that follicular tag is present, it has their DNA, and that's individual. Okay, another example would be blood type, if you can get that from your blood sample. But DNA would be an example of the individual evidence. Fingerprints, you can also get a subclass based on the, the type, loop, whirl, arches. Um, 
but if you have individual rig ridge characteristics like these types of minutiae, then you could actually narrow it down to one person. So if you said that you'd rather have individual evidence, then you would be right in being closer to narrowing down the perpetrator. There are a couple of important historical progressions in where we are currently in the way that forensic science plays out in conjunction with the court systems. So there are a couple of landmark cases, the first one being in 1923. Uh, Mr. Fry was convicted of second degree murder. He was tried at his uh, lower court and um, he had an expert witness that he hoped would testify to his have, having taken a systolic blood pressure polygraph test uh, or lie detector test. Um, however, the court refused to hear it because they said that it was not readily accepted uh, science in, in the scientific community. He appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court who reaffirmed that decision and said basically that um, that it has to be, if it's going to be used in court, it has to be having gained scientific rec recognition from both a psychological and physiological scientific community. So uh, he was convicted of second degree murder. The precedent still stands today. While the precedent of Fry still stands, it was um, added to by a uh, court case that happened in 1993 called Dober versus Merrill Dow Pharmaceuticals. Now in this case, Dober along with some other plaintiffs, and a, a plaintiff is someone who brings about a court case against another party. So Dober and, and some other plaintiffs uh, experienced a limb reduction defect uh, in their limbs. And um, they held that this pharmaceutical company was responsible for uh, releasing a type of drug that their mothers had taken when they were in utero uh, that they said led to this birth defect. So they were suing this, this company. Well, uh, it turns out that the scientists that they, the plaintiffs were using for their expert witness um, were testifying using uh, scientific research that was not widely accepted by the scientific community. In fact, the FDA currently still approves the use of that drug for pregnant women. And so uh, their lawsuit was turned down. And in addition to the fact that the technology or the science has to be um, in line with, with current scientific um, authority, the U.S. Supreme Court also ruled that this trial judge has the power of making that decision when it's in question as to whether the evidence falls into that category. And some questions you would ask to come to that decision, has it been tested, peer-reviewed, what's the rate of error, and what is generally accepted? This is a summary of those two cases and the outcomes that come from them. Notice that there is some overlap between them, so they weren't mutually exclusive of one another, but kind of had different um, periods of time and different things that they contributed. Feel free to pause the video to take a closer look at that. All right, this is another landmark case um, that has shaped the way that expert witness works uh, in the court. And it has to do with um, the, the fact that a new technique doesn't necessarily mean it's inadmissible. But again, it goes back to scientifically valid testimony. All right, this is going to take a look at um, some of the uh, judicial process, which begins with a suspect being arrested if there's probable cause. Uh, and then arraignment, which is the official reading of their um, the crimes being um, held against them, uh, then they can either accept a plea deal by um, by saying that they are guilty, or they can undergo a preliminary he hearing, uh, which includes a trial, jury deliberation, uh, and then if conviction, then sentencing, or appeals to a higher court, or acquittal. All right, take a moment to pause at the chapter summary. Thanks for joining in.